climbing skills. You just told me it was recording. Okay, yeah, I have some um, climbing skills, so that's always fun. We get to like snowmobiles or remote cave sites and actually go into the caves. And so I'll show you all some pictures of that. And then um, I help with a project called um, Bat Watch or the Neighborhood Bat Watch, where people can register if they have a bat colony. Um, in most provinces and some territories across Canada, including Ontario, and so. Our research actually stretches all the way from um, the border of Manitoba and Saskatchewan to southern Ontario. So we have a bat colony, for example, that we monitor on the Bruce Peninsula. So we have quite a big um, range of, um, of bat studies going on, although it has been a little bit more limited, unfortunately, due to COVID. So I'm going to share my presentation with you here and we'll get started. Sorry, just trying to find the button to make it a, a slideshow. This is working earlier. There we go. Okay, so this was actually not a bat in Ontario, in Ontario though it is a species that you do have. Uh, this is a little brown bat that um, one of my dear friends who is the White Nose Syndrome Coordinator for Canada um, took a picture of in PEI when he was camping. And this was just in the middle of the day. He was quite surprised to see it. Um, and seeing bats flying during the daytime is a sign often that bats are sick or there is something going on with them. And sure enough, white nose syndrome, which is a disease that affects a lot of hibernating bats and something I'll be talking about a bit later, is something that has been found in PEI. And so what he was seeing was a bat that was sick and likely having to go out and look for insects a lot earlier than it normally would have. So I always like to start off by just introducing people to what are bats. And I know as naturalists, you probably understand this anyways, but I really like to drill this point home because people tell me all the time that bats are just flying rodents, um, but they are so different in life history than rodents. Um, so here's a little bat looking up, uh, or a little mouse looking up at a bat saying, oh my goodness, an angel, but they are quite different. So a mouse actually has a reproductive uh, value in a year of up to 50 babies, whereas a bat will just have one or two babies per year. So they have a very slow reproductive rate, which is one of the reasons that when populations are threatened, they can take a very long time to rebound. Um, the oldest mouse celebrated its fourth birthday. And unfortunately, this presentation was a few years ago. So I think that um, he's probably passed on now, but that is the record for a mouse. Whereas the oldest bat found in the wild was actually 41 years old. And uh, we have regularly caught bats in our study area that were banded in the late 80s. And so we know that there are bats that are at least, you know, over 20 or that are often over 20 years old in our study areas, of Manitoba and Ontario as well. And so I always tell people that bats are more like little tiny flying bears instead of little tiny flying bats or little tiny flying mice. So what are bats? So bats, of course, are mammals, uh, which means that they feed their babies with milk and that they have fur. Some bats actually even have fur on their wings, like this beautiful quarry bat here. And they're part of their own group, the order Chiroptera. And the reason they're called Chiroptera is because that means hand wing. So it's really easy once you realize um, that their name is hand wing and you look at a bat wing, you can see how much their wings look like hands. So in this case, you can imagine that the bat's um, thumb, which is right here, is pointing straight up in the air. And then it's two finger, next two fingers are together. Here's its ring finger here. And then its pinky finger is this one. All of that is connected with webbing that goes down to the ankle. And then depending on the bat species, um, that may connect right to its tail as well. And it is allows them so much maneuverability. They just have to move their fingers all different um, 
ways in order to slightly change the, their trajectory. Um, and I have a video to show you in a little bit later that shows really how flexible that wing membrane is and all the things that they can do with it, including catch insects. So I always play this game, whether whether there's you know four-year-olds or 80-year-olds, I always think that this game is a really good um, way to show just the crazy diversity of bats. So um, you can just answer silently to yourself or raise your hand if you think that this is a bat. So many people may have seen this um, image posted around the internet. There was kind of a, a meme or uh, like a viral trend for a while showing how cute these bats, they are bats, um, are. And um, these are Australian flying foxes. They're among the biggest bats in the world. They actually have a wingspan of five feet. Um, and these bats, uh, surprisingly, are actually awake mostly in the daytime. So they kind of do some things that most people don't expect of bats. They're awake during the daytime. And they have really big eyes. Um, all bats can see. No bats are blind. However, these ones can see particularly well, and they don't even use echolocation to find their prey because their prey are nice, ripe, delicious fruit. Um, so this is just a picture of a big colony of bats roosting in a tree in Australia. Um, so is it a bat? So this um, is a bat. This is called the bulldog bat. And as you can see, it's big, big, big cheeks. And um, that's because this bat is actually a fisherman. So with this picture here, you can see these huge long claws. The way that this bat catches its prey is it will sit next to a pond and echolocate. And as it echolocates, it will listen for ripples on the water. As there are ripples on the water, it will take off from a tree, skim along the pond and use these big raking claws like a net to scoop up a fish and then stuff it into those really big cheeks, fly to a tree and gobble that prey item up. And they're just such a beautiful and surprising color. Is this a bat? <laughs> so I think most of you probably know that this is a house mouse and not a bat. But I do think that this just really shows how you know different uh, their faces actually are. Um, so this little white cotton ball is also a bat. This is called the Honduran white bat. Um, they're a fascinating species. These bats are found uh, throughout Central and some parts of South America as well. And they're actually a tent making bat. So they will find a big broad leaf in the rainforest, shoot little tiny holes in it, and that causes the leaf to fold over, making a little tent. And then the bats will be in that tent. And because it's folded over, they'll be protected from the rain. Um, they're protected from predators that way. And as that leaf dies, they'll go and they'll find a new, a new nice leaf to chew little holes in. And so I was very, very lucky. I actually got to go to Costa Rica for a bat conference. And we went for a hike in the rainforest. And I saw this leaf right above our trail and unfortunately there weren't any bats in it but you know as bat biologists we could recognize right away what had been there which were some bats and um really cool to see so i actually oh i meant to update this there's actually over 1400 species of bats so because of um molecular uh molecular studies they're learning that some species which they thought were the same species are actually two separate species. So this number has been increasing quite a bit since the advent of quick um, genotyping of bats. So there's over 1400 species of bats worldwide and they are found on every single continent except for Antarctica. And I hope what I've shown you so far is really um, 
you know, given the idea of just how diverse they are, both in you know, what they eat, their sizes, and what they look like. Um, this bat here uh, is a spotted bat. They have the largest ears to body ratio of any bat uh, in North America, and they are actually found in British Columbia. And um, their echolocation is so low, you can hear the bottom end of it if, if you have really high hearing. So probably especially teenagers are able to hear those bats echolocate. Um, Bats are so important. So the main reasons bats are important um, are they spread seeds. So in some areas, for example, in a lot of rainforests, they find that if it wasn't for bats, there wouldn't be um, basically seeds spreading from one place to another. Same thing with a lot of desert environments. Uh, bats are also essential for pollination and they're essential for pollination of some of the things that, you know, human beings really enjoy, such as uh, chocolate, coffee. Um, they're the only, they're the main pollinator of agave, which is used to make tequila. And um, here in Canada, the most important things that bats do for us is eat a ton of bugs. So all bats in Canada are um, insectivores. They all eat insects. And I have a video here just to show you the amazing superpower they have in terms of ability to catch insects. So what you'll see is a bat flying. <laughs> what you'll see is a bat, uh, an insect flying and then bats coming to catch it, that insect. And you'll see both the amazing um, sounds that they make as they're approaching the insects and then also what they can do with their wings. Sorry, Kaylee, I don't think we're getting the video. Oh shoot, I'm sorry about that. I think you might have to maybe stop sharing and share again. Sounds good, good to know, okay. I probably shared my presentation and not the, my screen here, so. Thank you. Okay, is it working now? Oh, it's just taking a second. There we go. I think it's good now. see that one used its whole tail membrane as its like plate basically. And their tail membrane is a really good trap for those insects. Sometimes the moths get away, and I think sometimes the moths just taste bad, <laughs> so they let them go as well. There's some moths that are poisonous or really bitter, and there are actually some moths that echolocate in a way that tells the bats that they're unappetizing. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just trying to With mail check, you could okay, can you see my presentation again? Yep, you're back on the presentation. Fantastic. Yeah, so um, I could almost give a whole another side talk about just the amazing um, adaptations of moths. I mean, I'm not an expert, but Moths uh, have evolved along with bats, and so it's so fascinating. They actually will, as bats echolocate to figure out where moths are, moths can actually make very large noises back, which help um, basically like mess up the echolocation so the bats can't figure out exactly where they are. Or moths can also yeah, make sounds that indicate that they're not appetizing to bats as well. Um, all kinds of very cool adaptations um, that um, moths have developed so that they don't become a snack. But 
they often become snacks. So um, in Ontario, there are three migratory species. So there's the silver haired bat, which you see here on the bottom left, uh, the hoary bat, which you see on the bottom right, and the eastern red bat, which is on the top right. And um, all of these bats tend to be fairly solitary, although silver haired bats you will sometimes find in really small groups of females in the spring time raising their pups. Um, and these bats are often using trees. So especially Eastern reds and hoary bats, um, sometimes Eastern reds look like little orange mushrooms on trees. You'll think like, oh, that's just a mushroom on the tree and then and that's bright orange. And then you notice that it's actually just a little bat that's been folded, that's all folded up. They'll also hang sometimes in dead leaves. And then hoary bats tend to be just on branches like fairly exposed. Uh, silver haired bats will often tuck more like under loose bark and are quite like very camouflaged. Um, and interestingly, even though silver head or bats are considered migratory and they do move south for the winter, they may move south to a place where they migrate for short periods of time. And they've also found um, eastern red bats occasionally in leaf litter hibernating for periods of time as well. So um, our strict categories of migratory and hibernating are changing a little bit as we're starting to figure out more about the ecology of bats. The biggest threat to these species of bats are wind turbines. So I was actually got my start in bats studying um, the impact of wind turbines on bats. So I was just an undergrad uh, research assistant for the summer and my job was to get up every day with the sun and walk 13 kilometers in circles around wind turbines looking for dead bats and we found dead bats every single day. Um, we set up detectors at wind turbines and we set up detectors at tall structures like cell phone towers that didn't kill bats. And we found that during the migration season, bats were actually attracted to these tall structures. So we saw that activity increased in the fall time at both wind turbines and at cell phone towers. And so it seems that migratory bats, unfortunately, do seem to be really attracted to wind turbines because of their height and the way that they stand out on the landscape. Um, these bats are migrating long distances, so there's still some speculation of why that is, why they're attracted to tall structures. It could be that when they're flying long distances, they're trying to look for tall structures um, because Historically, that would indicate a safe place to, um, to spend the night um, or spend the day if you're a bat. Um, we also think that these bats are really solitary. So it could be that these bats are using very tall structures, like they would use a large tree, for example, in a forest as a place to find mates. So they might be using these as a landmark to find other reproductive bats. But Virtually whatever the reason, it does kill large numbers of bats across North America. Um, what we, the good news about this is that for many wind farms, um, the impact can be extremely um, reduced as long as they, um, how do I explain it? So basically all wind turbines are still when the wind isn't blowing. And it takes a certain speed of wind in order for that wind turbine to start moving. So if they increase the speed of wind to a, a higher speed, then bats are less likely to fly, but they don't lose very much, um, very much power production. Um, because they wouldn't be making a lot of energy at that low wind speed anyways. And so this has actually been implemented in many wind, wind farms across Canada and throughout Europe. 
and has been extremely successful. So it will lower mortality by 90 to 95%. Um, so there are great solutions to this problem. Um, and they only need to do that for the few weeks of the year where bats are migrating. And for even if they limit it to the first four hours after uh, sunset, it can be amazing. So there just needs to be the political will um, and the impetus to base in the legal impetus to do this at other uh, sites as well. Um, throughout Ontario, there are also five hibernating species. So I just put up this picture because they all look quite similar to the untrained eye. They are fluffy and brown and they hibernate in mines and caves. Um, and, and they're all facing a similar threat, um, which is white nose syndrome. Um, so white nose syndrome, yeah, so white nose syndrome is a fungus and it grows on bats as they're hibernating. This fungus was first found in the winter of 2006, 2007 in New York State. And um, basically a biologist went in to do a normal winter count of bats. And instead of finding the bats all healthy on the ceiling, he found them dead in huge piles of like tens of thousands. This was a huge cave on the floor. And then also uh, bats that were actively dying or covered in white fungus. So this is actually this middle picture is a picture that was taken by that person, Alan Hicks. And um, this is another picture on the left that Nancy Hillslip um, took in those first, in that first winter of white nose syndrome. Uh, white nose syndrome since 2006, 2007 has spread all the way to Saskatchewan in Canada. So we, um, I, yeah, I can't, unfortunately I can't remember the exact year that it entered Ontario, but it has been there for quite a long time now. Um, populations have taken large dips. So for example, in the Kenora region where we do a lot of uh, bat studies, um, places that used to have, you know, 40 or 50 bats in a summer went down to having like two or three. And we saw that big drop in population in the 2016 summer and, or in the 20, sorry, in the 2017 summer. 2016, there were about 50 bats. 2017, there were like three bats. And then um, now finally, we're starting to see those numbers slowly start to increase again. Um, so because uh, we work with this fungus, we don't want to be the ones that are spreading it from cave to cave. So when we are working with bats, we're wearing these big white Tyvek suits, we wear gloves, um, and we have a decontamination protocol. We use lots of, we we're using hand sanitizer before it was cool, and um, really good on the decontamination um, side of things to make sure that we're not spreading the fungus, but the bats do a fantastic job of it. Unfortunately, all on their own as a single bat can move 500 kilometers in a year. So, you know, how do scientists help and what kind of questions are we asking in our lab? So one of the major things uh, that we ask are just basic natural history questions like where are bats? How many are there? and what is normal population fluctuations and what are normal behaviors. And one of the main way, or one of the major ways that we learn about where bats are is through our citizen science uh, projects called Neighborhood Bat Watch. So we have many collaborators across Canada um, and this is a website where property owners or you know, anybody can go and register if they know of where a bat colony is. And they can actually submit counts of these bats as well. And so on this, um, on this map here, all of the little yellow houses are bat colonies that have been registered. And then all of the green houses that you see are when counts have actually been uh, registered. And so it's great, like we have some people who will send in, you know, 10 counts a year and really track the progress of their batch throughout the summertime. And we can get such a great 
um, idea of how these populations are changing throughout the active season and also between years as well. So this is a graph, for example, of the type of data that we get from citizen scientists. Um, this is a big brown bat colony in southern Ontario. On the left hand side, you can see the number of big brown bats and on the X axis at the bottom, you see um, the summer months. So May, July, September, November, we skip a few there just for <laughs> to leave it a little bit less crowded. Um, so at the beginning of May is when this person noticed that they started to have bats. Um, the population rapidly increased throughout May. And we kind of know from um, the life history of bats that about mid-July, or sorry, mid-June is when we'll see the peak adult population. So that's a really good time to do counts and figure out how many bats are there. Um, so we can see at this person's colony, there's probably in the order of about 90 or so adults. And then all of a sudden, uh, at the beginning of July, that population just perks right up. And that's because suddenly all the juveniles start flying as well. And so that number can really give us an idea of um, the proportion of juveniles to adults and therefore the success, reproductive success of that bat colony and how many adults are actually having babies. Um, and then throughout the rest of the summer and the fall, we see that population drop off. But what was so interesting about this site too is like we thought that bat colonies really dropped off suddenly to zero, you know, by September, but they actually had stragglers all the way into November before those ones finally left, presumably to go to a winter hibernation site. And so this is just a, the steps that it takes to um, submit a count. So you just visit the website, download the count protocol, pick a beautiful night to count bats, record how many bats exit, and upload the count. And so it's fantastic because we have lots of people participating and helping us collect that data. Um, one really great way that both we and our citizen scientists study bats is by listening for bats. And so at these colonies where people know they have bats, they don't know what type of bats they have, we have a program where we can actually lend them a bat detector. And so um, it is, so here's a picture of it up here in the right hand corner and it actually just plugs into either an iPhone or we have iPods that we can lend out to people. And um, it's quite easy. We have it all set up so people just have to hit the record button at the right time of night and it will start listening for bats. And so um, the really cool thing is that bats emit different sounds at different pitches and at different uh, rates at different stages of the hunt. So a lot of the time we'll hear bats um, searching so I actually have a video of that as well. Um, so what you'll hear is you'll hear bat, a bat searching for prey. And then all of a sudden they'll detect prey. And so they have what's called the approach phase where those sounds will get, those pulses will get much closer together as they approach their prey and try to figure out exactly where it is. And then they have a terminal buzz um, at the end, which lets us know um, that they've really narrowed in on the prey. And we can actually somewhat study, um, so we can study you know, whether or not bats are hunting, what proportion of calls are uh, have feeding buzzes in it, so therefore they detected prey. And based on the pattern of that buzz and when they start hunting again, we can figure out if that hunt has actually been successful as well. So we can evaluate different types of foraging habitat this way, for example. This is when it's searching. It starts getting closer together. And then it really drops off at the end um, when it has a feeding buzz. And so this is just a visual representation of that. So they have a search phase where everything's kind of 
uh, these pulses are fairly regular, it's much closer together, and then all of a sudden you'll see all the pulses right next to each other. And so if I'm looking at the data and analyzing it, I can, I can pick those speeding buzzes out. And different species will echolocate at uh, different frequencies as well, or in some of their calls look different. And so, especially in Manitoba and Ontario, where there's a limited, where there's just you know six species in Manitoba's case, eight in Ontario, we can use um, acoustic data to really narrow in on what kind of species are present. One of the cool things that, like I said, that I get to do in my job is actually go into caves. So after the active season, um, hibernating bats go to caves or mines to hibernate. And once per year, uh, we will go in and take a photo of every single bat that is in the cave. We may also swab uh, some bats while they're hibernating without, you know, picking them up, but just like with the uh, with a, yeah, a swab, <laughs> like a, basically a Q-tip. And um, we may also swab just the substrate to see if uh, the fungus is present on the walls. Um, and so this cave here on the right-hand side, all of these clumps that just look like fungus on the walls or moss, those are all clumps of bats. And this cave has about 7,000 bats in it. And uh, this is me over here. And so once we get back to the lab, um, sometimes me, sometimes some poor undergrad has to look at every single one of those files and, you know, open it up in paint program or something and just dot all those bats and do a count of how many there are. And so um, I think this clump of bats has about, you know, 150 to 200 bats. One of the ways that uh, we also catch bats is by using a harp trap. So this trap would be set up in the entrance of a cave or a mine, somewhere where there's large concentration of bats or they're using a single pathway. And it's much like the instrument, the harp. So it has strings that are spaced about an inch to two inches apart. And um, there's two sets of strings that are maybe about eight inches apart. The bats will often see the first set of strings, so they'll be flying horizontally and then they'll turn vertically to avoid that set of strings, but they either don't expect the second or they can't stay vertical long enough to avoid it. And so what's great about this is they slow down to do that maneuver and so they gently hit the second set and then just fall into a nice bag. It's quite easy to scoop them up. Um, another way we catch bats, which is a little bit uh, more difficult uh, for us and, and probably for the bats as well, uh, because it takes some untangling, is with uh, really big nets. So this net on the right hand side is actually about 30 feet high. It's as high as a two story house. Um, it's on a pulley system. It's really easy to set up. And as if we catch bats that are up high, we can lower it down. Um, and someone mentioned that you know birding is like fishing and i always think that this is really night fishing for bats or sky fishing <laughs> for bats i always feel that way those big nets up in the sky and so this is often the way that we would catch migratory individuals or when bats are roosting in houses this can be really helpful once we catch bats, um, we study, we mark them somehow. Uh, we tend to use microchips in our lab. Um, so these are the exact same technology that's used in animals like dogs and cats and other veterinary practices. Um, it is about the size of a grain of rice, a little bit bigger, and it goes in between their shoulder blades um, under the skin. And the, real, the nice thing about that method and microchipping bats is then we can set up scanners. So that's what this picture is, the bottom right. We can set up a scanner in the entrance of a cave or a mine or a bat house and get data every time that bat passes by that scanner. So we can get yearly survival, we can get timing of when hibernation starts, and uh, we can get really interesting uh, movement data and all types of population level data from microchipping bats. Uh, bands can also be helpful as well. 
However, you do have to physically recapture that fat and recapturing fats are hard because they're very smart and there's many of them and they always, they never do what you expect. And so um, we do occasionally ban fats, but that would tend to be more for if we had a captive study going on or if we're at a site where they are particularly loyal. Um, and this picture here is of a bat where the blue on the right hand side we know is from 1988. And then this band here, I believe was from 2008. So they rebanded it because the blue tag just had the ear. It didn't have an individual um, number associated with it, but these bands or these bands were put on uh, 20 years apart from each other and this bat looked great, nice and fat and fluffy. Um, one of the other things that we might do uh, to catch bats and to study where they're going and uh, to assess you know, what types of habitat they use is we might radio track them. So I was completely um, so lucky to be able to do a study in 2013 on the Bruce Peninsula where we caught bats and radio tracked them. Um, we also did a similar thing at uh, Long Point as well. So it was amazing. So we'd have our nets up all night and then um, the birders would just come out and take it take um, over them basically. And so those nets were open a lot of the day catching bats or birds. But um, with radio tracking, we capture an individual who give it a little haircut and then we glue a radio tag onto their back and that helps. And then um, we use glue that you'd use in a hospital. Um, so it tends to wear off after maybe three weeks or a month or so. Um, or they groom it off within a few days, um, depending how, <laughs> how things go. And then um, we can get a really cool sense of, you know, how far they're foraging in a single night and um, how their, you know, foraging range changes, uh, for example, once they have juveniles flying, things like that. So one of the things that we do in our lab is we really do focus on uh, white nose syndrome and its effects, us, especially on little brown bats. Um, one of the things that we've looked at is, for example, you know, what, what does white nose syndrome do to bats? How does it hurt bats? Um, we had a captive study in 2011 and 2013 um, on white nose syndrome in bats, trying to um, well, the first, the first one was just trying to figure out what it did, why was it was causing a problem for all of these animals. And um, we also looked at whether it was in an invasive fungus or not. And so um, basically what we found is that bats from Germany will grow the fungus, but they will not get sick, which really indicates that it is an invasive fungus from Europe and genetic evidence has also um, proven that as well. And the other thing that we learned is that um, it really disrupted bats hibernation. So a healthy hibernating bat will stay at cave temperature. So let's say five degrees, their body temperature will drop to five degrees for two to three weeks at a time. And then they warm up. That's a healthy hibernator. This happens um, across most hibernating bat species that we know of. So they'll be five degrees for two to three weeks and then they'll warm up for just a couple hours back to you know, 37 degrees Celsius and then cool right back down to five degrees. And um, instead of warming up every two to three weeks, we saw that they were starting to warm up every two to three days. And so this eats up their fat reserves and causes all kinds of problems for them. And so um, ultimately what we are interested in, of course, is how do we make bats healthy and how can we protect the habitat of bats, especially ones that are threatened. So one of the projects that we have is called the Heated Bat House Project. So um, basically I drove from here to on Toronto and back and uh, We've put up 40 of these houses, 20 of them are heated and 20 of them are not. Um, they have a 
basically like a reptile heating pad in them that's attached to a thermostat. And so once it reaches 30 degrees, that heating pad turns off. And the idea is, um, is that bats that are hibernating often will come out of hibernation too early while it's still freezing outside. And it takes a lot of energy for bats to um, stay warm above zero degrees. And so this provides a thermal refuge for them, a place that's nice and warm. We also know that bats are really trying to maintain a high body temperature when they come out of hibernation because they have a lot of damage to their wings and maintaining a high body temperature helps them heal faster. And so by providing them somewhere warm to go, potentially they'd be able to heal faster. Um, and the third thing is we know that when bats are warm and have a stable temperature, they can um, have babies earlier in the year. Babies that are born earlier in the year are able to survive or they're more likely to. Um, we also only set these up at places where there was already a bat colony. So that also gave bats a choice. If this wasn't working for them, they could be in uh, the roost that they were used to. And we found that occupation was you know, quite high at these, uh, at these heated bat houses. And we're still in the preliminary stages because getting bats to use bat houses, even nice heated ones, is really hard, especially when their populations are dropping. But we are hoping to have some data out or some, some data out about that soon. Um, and the other thing that I think was really helpful about these houses is that they're insulated. And so one of the things that we were seeing is that even when, when there were heat waves where temperature was you know, going up to like 37, um, the temperature inside the bat houses wasn't peaking as extremely in these ones because the insulation helped a little bit with um, stopping like um, some of our unheated bat houses. You really saw the temperature rise, 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 whereas this one had a more stable temperature even at hot temperatures. So thank you so much uh, for listening. I would love to yeah, chat and take any questions. I got a question. Great. What, how, do you de, how do you define a bat colony? Like, are you talking about maybe a few isolated bats living in a bat house, or are you talking about a mass of bats living in a cave somewhere? <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, the truth is, it could be either. So, as soon as we say, like, as soon as we see adult bats living in a congregation, that's a colony. Um, I think the yeah, like the, the thing that's interesting about, you know, little brown bats, for example, like right now, if we find a, a colony of just bats, it's probably because the population has really dropped. So even though it seems like, oh, maybe that shouldn't be a colony, I think that historically it probably was and it will have more bats in it again. But it tends in the summertime colonies of bats in, in Canada, at least it the way that they're socially set up can vary a lot throughout the world, but um, basically in Canada, in the summertime, females will raise their um, pups all together. So all the females of most hibernating species, for example, will all get together in small groups and raise their pups. And then in the winter time, then they're in, then they're in their caves and the colonies tend to be much larger. Okay, I have a question. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I was going to say, what's the best? How's the best place to hang a bat house? I have, I have a bat house, mm -hmm. and and I haven't been successful. But um, like, how high and what direction and things great, like that. Great question. Um, so I can definitely send you some resources afterwards for more information on that. But um, basically, bats like it like to be high up and they like to be hot. So above 10 feet, um, you want a really clear path for them to drop 
because they tend to drop out of the house before they uh, glide and then take right. and they flap to fly up. Um, and facing south or southeast. And okay. um, there's a really, yeah, it depends. It, it's hard right now. So basically what they used to advise was that bat houses in Canada almost ubiquitously should be painted black as well. Right. So that's really warm. But now that we have such extreme heat, um, heat waves oh. and stress, there's some concern that maybe they get too hot. Ah. So, um, mm -hmm. so mm. it does depend a little bit on like the unique where it is. That you yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, Kaylee, um, yeah. I, uh, this is an odd question, but I just, is bat scat a good fertilizer and is it safe? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it can be, so it can be heat treated, for example. Um, one of the problems is that it isn't always sustainably harvested. So there's really nowhere in Canada that has bat um that has bat guano um, if, in such large quantities because our summer bats just often tend to not group in such large quantities. And so while using bat scat as a fertilizer might be safe for you, it might not be safe for okay. the people or the, the bat, right? Yeah, or the bat colony where it's being harvested as well. Okay. And we've actually, I've heard some really interesting stories about you know some of the caves where they've found really high numbers of different coronaviruses for example mm -hmm. um, there are people who are harvesting bat guano because it's a, it's a way to make a living you know no judgment at all but um you know these people don't necessarily have access to the ppe to keep them safe from interacting with the bats as well so there are some concerns I would say with using bat guano even though personally it might it is a good fertilizer but it might not be um the safest fertilizer for the world <laughs> I guess thank you yeah you're welcome Kaylee <clears throat> Kaylee I'd like to ask I have a bat house and I've had it for I don't know 15 or 20 years and I always had lots of bats there's not as many these years but they're still been active and oh, then good. Part way through the year this year all of a sudden there was no more bat droppings it just like totally stopped i still have bats around you know yeah. they'll, they'll be roosting in different places around and they'll you know find a bit of droppings on the deck or in a shed or something like that um so i just wondered should i be um just taking the bat thing down and cleaning it or should i be rebuilding a new one should i put it in the same place a new place you know what should yeah. i do to try and take care of them um, so the only thing that I, the only reason, um, that I think people might have to clean their bat house is if it has like a ledge that does collect guano, most yeah. of them tend to just be like open underneath and then everything falls down and it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, do you know about when your population dropped off? Ah, they were there in this early in the spring, but I don't remember. You know, it's been at least a month or more that I haven't okay. seen. Okay, yeah. you know, it could just be. So we were catching bats, and because of like, I'm not sure exactly how the weather was where you were, but we had a very like an extra warm uh, spring and summer, and so we found that like the juveniles in, for example, the Panora area were flying so much earlier. So the bats came out of hibernation earlier than normal and the juveniles were flying much earlier than we've ever seen before and so it could be that perhaps you know the mums and their pups were just strong enough to move on to wherever they go next so some bats will use the bat houses throughout the fall but we find with a lot of like little brown bat colonies for example um beginning of august they're they're done and maybe you'll get yeah a few like here and there using it uh, throughout okay. the fall and would it be good still to take it down and clean it? What, what would your recommendation be for, for I'd that? Say you can probably leave it as is. Yeah. yeah that would be okay. fine. Yeah. You could always, you know, you know, wear a mask and have gloves and, and, you know, basically use like a long duster or something to okay. you think that there is 
anything um, up there. Mostly what gets in bats way are spider webs. <laughs> that's like usually what okay. makes be kind of knocked out of the way. Oh, that's um, great. But if oh. they've been using it, yeah, I'd say that's great. Do you happen to know what species you have there? I think they're little brown bats. I don't know. I oh, just always thought that's what they were. But, um, well, if you're ever interested in yeah, joining Bat Watch and, and we'd be happy to lend you a detector if you ever wanted oh, to. That'd be fabulous. Yeah, yeah, no, excellent. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. That's great. Thank you. I have, I have a, a question. Oh, oh, go ahead, Susan. I had a question, Kaylee, about the lifespan. Um, <laughs> I know some of the bats you said can live a long time. Um, is there an average lifespan for the, the bats in Ontario when they're healthy? Um, yeah, it's hard to say. Um, just because studying bats over a long period, like the same individuals over a long period of time, is just so hard in bats. <laughs> they're just, they're wily. Um, yeah. So our best guess is probably, um, we think that the most bats, like the migratory ones, especially like quarry bats, red bats, um, probably silver haired bats live about like 13 to 15 years or so. And then um, little brown bats, like we know they can live up to, you know, 30, 35 years in the wild. However, no. their average lifespan is, is probably less than that, especially given the threat. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's that's the ideal. So there's quite a range then of ages. Yeah, yeah. interesting. But still, I, f I find that a lot of people are very surprised to learn that they live more than like two or three years. So it's, yeah. Yeah, well, they, if you think they're a rodent, rodents don't live long, right? But they're yeah, not, exactly. so, yeah. <laughs> One other thing, and you may have mentioned this, but I, I didn't uh, catch it, but where do they migrate to? Um, so, we know that they go, that some individuals go as far south as um, Texas and maybe even Mexico. Um, but most of those studies have all just been done on isotopes. So they basically take like a hair sample and they can figure out at what latitude that bat grew their hair at. <laughs> like, you know, the, the no okay. so individuals <laughs> have been um, like captured. Yeah. Um, so they have a. It's just a general idea, not they don't actually know like the, the, yeah. the, the caves are or the roosts, yeah. Okay. But it's really cool. There are um, like technologies advancing all the time. And so we're really hoping that they'll be able to make a GPS tag that's small enough to study bats, but it's just not there yet because that would be the ultimate getting those, you know, pings of learning where they, they are. mentioned that in the show last night. Yes. Yeah, the technology yeah. wasn't quite there because they're they're so tiny, their they're bodies so, are so light. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And they fly like so much, <laughs> so fast. And yeah. fast. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. My question, Kaylee, um, uh, you know, bats have kind of been in the news uh, with COVID. Some people blame COVID on bats. I don't I don't think anybody in North America eats bats, do they? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so no <laughs> how many people all around the world do eat bats and then these when you hear about it in these markets in china are they farming these bats or catching them in the wild or um how much of a problem is that um so it, it depends where you are it can be an impact on the population for sure i think um so i've done i listened to a very nerdy virology podcast which is like really looked into a lot of the um yeah, the sources. Uh, so basically the coronavirus that was found in bats is 95 or 96% like the coronavirus that's circulating. So it's still the difference between like us and a chimpanzee. So it's not exact, we think it evolved in bats, but then it went somewhere else and we're not totally sure where. And it could be, you know, bats interact with other animals in lots of different ways. So it, in predation, for example, we know that even, you know, cats can eat bats. So, so I'm like working on a study right now, looking at bats, uh, bats that have been brought into rehab centers because cats have attacked them, for example. Um, so cats could potentially be an interface between bats and people, um, or all of these wild animals that interact with bats and then people bring them into 
bring those into markets. Or it could be potentially that, you know, people that are working in guano mines, for example, could catch a respiratory virus from bats. So yeah, there's all kinds of different things that could be a problem, you know, for us and viruses. But then I do know that um, in some, I think the biggest issue with the bats and humans isn't necessarily hunting them for, um, isn't hunting them for food, but it's hunting them because they believe that it's a threat to uh, crops. So for example, if bats are like eating a lot of fruit, there's been some places where they've culled tens of thousands of bats and it's really detrimental to the ecosystem. Okay, well, if anybody else has any questions, one. speak up now or forever hold your peace. I have a follow-up question. question. Okay, Bob. Um, about bat houses. Yeah. Uh, at, our, at our Honey Harbor Cottage, we have a bat house. Yeah. To the best of my knowledge, bats never use it. But we do have some patio umbrellas on our deck. And every year, bats seem to raise their young in the patio umbrella. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, can I can I carry on with this thought? Um, yeah. So just just to see to test test a hypothesis, I took an old umbrella and I put it next to the bat house to see if the bats preferred the bat house or the umbrella. And it turns out they preferred neither. They preferred <laughs> the ones on our deck that we want to use. Yes. So <laughs> as a consequence, we don't use our patio umbrellas all summer long. And, and Bob, are you are you going to tell us everybody where you bought this bat umbrella so we can all go <laughs> and get it instead of the bat boxes? Or I think it was Canadian Tire, and I you know I regret making the effort to build a bat house when I could have just gone out and bought another umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there any particular species that favors umbrellas, or <laughs> <laughs> so we do tend to see. Um occasionally we'll see little brown there but not really it tends to be like um some of the some of the tree roosting bats that i would say that are going to use an umbrella instead of a bat house but i would love to see pictures and id your bats that would be fantastic if you have any i would love to let you know what kind of bats you have um we they're actually designing a house um that is like basically looks like loose bark that just goes around the pole because we know that there's some bats that just don't care about bat houses but maybe they would just like something skinny to crawl under and that's probably what they're using your umbrella for too <laughs> well how would i get a photo of these bats like we can open the umbrella and, and see them up in there i guess i could point a camera up in the umbrella would that be sufficient for you uh yeah, that's fine if you can't either. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to put. The if I can interrupt, the sorry, I'm getting an echo here. But here's a picture that one of the. Turn off your. Can you see that? Oh, kind of. Uh, you might have to send it to me. <laughs> I don't know how to send it, but. It's on a chair. It's on a chair. Yeah. It looks like a it like looks like a little brown bat bum to me, but I'd have to see the whole. Okay. I'd have to see more of it. Yeah. <laughs> if you can email it to me at all, Ray, I can pass it on to Kaylee. Um. Perfect. Yeah, that would be great, for sure. Um, I could also yeah, if if anyone has bats on their property and is interested in knowing what kind they have, I'm happy to also send a bat detector. That might be the easiest way to kind of figure out what kind of bats are in your umbrella as well. I'll, I'll probably take you up on that because I'm, you know, they've been here years and years, you know, for a decade or more. They've been coming. Oh, that's so cool! And they tend to prefer. We used to have a black umbrella. They liked that because I guess it was nice and hot. It's sitting out in full sun. Yeah. But we replaced that with a yellow one. They don't seem to like that as much. The the red ones. <laughs> the dog. The dog. Yeah, they, you know, they do use it though. And I, we've got at least two families going. Some sometimes three. Very neat. Okay, I think that covered pretty well all the questions. I think, uh, Susan, do you want to uh, thank our speaker? And then I've got something a little extra to add to the meeting when, when you've done that. Something at the end? Okay.
Yes, Kaylee, that was wonderful. Really interesting. Um, your, your presentation style was very good, by the way. Um, and it's just, yeah, the more we learn about bats, wow, they're just like, there's a lot of amazing stuff about them, isn't there? And how important they are in the ecosystem. So um, we appreciate getting to know more about them. And uh, thank you for, for doing that all the way from Winnipeg. Oh, my pleasure. I love chatting bats. It's so fun. <laughs> we, can, we can tell your enthusiasm is very genuine. <laughs> so thank you again. You're welcome. Okay, um, I guess that's about it, Ken. I just, you know, thank everybody for attending and um, stay tuned for whatever happens next month. There's lots of things we can learn about. Yeah, one, and way, I, I one can, way or another. <laughs> I, I can tell everybody what's going to happen. Thanks again, Kaylee, but I'll tell everyone what's going to happen next month and then I'm going to try to share something else a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let me just. Uh, Just trying to manage things here. I think people can see me now, can they? Yep. Um, yeah, next month uh, we booked it. I think we kind of figure we're still going to be on Zoom next month, unfortunately. We, we are hoping to do in-person meetings as soon as we can. But until uh, Ontario enter, enters what they're calling the exit stage, which might be a little ways away, I think we're going to stay on Zoom. So we booked a speaker for the third Thursday in October, which is October 21st. And our speaker will be Jessica Linton. Uh, Jessica Linton is a biological consultant who works on a variety of species of risk inventory, uh, blah, 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 blah. But the, her main claim to fame right now, is she's working on a provincial recovery strategy for a little, but pretty little butterfly called the model dusky wing. And there's a couple of spots in Ontario where this this butterfly, which used to be Ontario, but was extirpated, they're trying to introduce it, reintroduce it. She's also working on two or three other butterflies that are in a similar situation, the Frosted Elfin, the Eastern Perseus Dusky Wing, and the Carner Blue. And uh, Jessica is also president of the Toronto Entomologists Association, and she's supposed to be an excellent presenter. So she's going to tell us all about this interesting work. And, uh, well, of course, you'll all get in more information about that, and... Um, and the, uh, the Zoom invitation as well. And just for anybody that joined late today, we did tape the, the presentation. And uh, if it all works out, we'll be sending you a, a link for a, a video. Um, so now I'm going to try to share my screen. See, I'm just trying to go full screen here. In the tour of your computer, Ken. <laughs> yeah, let me struggle this for a bit here. Um, this is my name. Well, I think that's the best I'm going to get. So I'll go on, but. Uh, as you all know, our club has been a supporter of the OWL Foundation for many years. And um, every year they send us an invitation for a couple members to go down, or a few members to go down and visit. And this year uh, we had uh, Deepthi Rajapaksi and Gaia Seagram. I think Gaia might be with us tonight. Uh, they went down and toured the OWL Foundation. I got a few photos that they've shared with us. And I have a trip report here that Deepthi sent. And I'll just read it as we look at a few pictures. Here's Gaia and here's Deepthi and they're in front of the donor wall. Somewhere in that donor wall, there's a little plaque that thanks the Midland Penetanguishing Field Naturalists for their support. So here's Mary. She says, um, 
Uh, Gaia was uh, my morning wake-up call. The alarm went off at 5.30 a.m. We met up at the Food Basic parking lot at 6.45 a.m. No gas stations open for business, so Barry en route was the place to get gas at black market prices. Two old ladies on a Sunday morning drive, and a great drive it was that both of us thoroughly enjoyed our first outing in 18 months. We were not going to waste time finding places to eat, so we had our own bag breakfast and lunch, hot coffee, etc. There must have been a few more like us on the 400-401 QEW West, but we made it a good time with one wrong exit trying to get to the QEW to Hamilton, Niagara Falls. But we were at the Owl Foundation by 9.30 a.m., believe it or not, the first car on the newly painted parking lot. Um, our guide was Phil Goodwin, a fine person, very knowledgeable, friendly. On his first job, and a job well done it was, he took the photo of me and Gaia. Um, on the tour, there were four of us, all female, with Phil. I think this is a, uh, a, um, a great, great great owl. Great that she's, Great horned owl. Is it a great horn, do you think? Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, oh, Phil told us to stay with the group, and you know I have challenges on that issue. This is Mary, a deep theme, and I got ambushed by the short-eared owl, the only cage where I could stick my camera through the mesh, and I was not going to miss that one. There's the short-eared owl there. Phil later found me, and I stuck up my hand for a spanking and got one. <laughs> The owls were in large cages with trees in the middle of the cages, tree trunks placed as perching spots. It was fast, sad for me to see them like this, but this is better than a roadkill. There's some of the snowy owls. There were quite a number of people with masks on that I positively disliked, but hey, it is what it is. So we had to keep moving like a conveyor belt as the paths were narrow. One could not take pics anyway through the wired cages. The birds were very skittish and were hiding due to the people traffic and the constant chatter. So it was not easy to get a good look at the birds. Anyway, it was a good experience for me and Gaia. As seen in the photos, details of the occupant, the reason for being there, were described. There were two great gray owls from March, April 2005, when we had that great gray owl eruption, and there were many road kills and injuries. To think these two are still alive and well 16 years later was a good thing, but I don't know if I want to be locked up in a cage for the rest of my life. Of course, a lot of the owls down the Owl Foundation are treated and released. At least Southern Ontario folks like me get to see what a great gray looks like. I had one back then right next to my home and have the most gorgeous photos of my first ever digital camera. This was the sad part for me, having seen so many snowies here in our area, great horned in Cottonwood, Arizona, barred owls down my street, to see these species will spend the rest of their lives in a cage. I hope the snowy you got is feather singed short eared that had its wing fractured will get better and fly away. The volunteers are doing a great job on the owls. This is the short eared owl here. Guy and myself, we made a donation for the fund. Once we were done around noon, we headed out, did some fresh fruit veggie shopping from a roadside stand, had freshly made, made peach gelato, gelato, and made it back to Midland by 3 p.m. Great trip. That's from Deepthi Rajapaksi. And there's the, uh, the snowy with the singed wing. Another snowy. So I stop my share here, and that was the little extra little bit that we had here. Guy, are you still on the call? I'll look for Guy. Yeah, there she is. Guy, unmute yourself, and you can tell us what you thought of the place. Yes, it was a, a great trip. I was very impressed. <laughs> driving in with the grounds and the organization. The people were all very friendly and knowledgeable. Um, the only sad thing was it was kind of a dark day, so we couldn't see in the cages very well. And the, some of the birds, like we wanted to see Chimney, who's the bird who's sponsored by the Nasons who kindly gave us their ticket. We couldn't see Chimney because he was hiding in his box. And there were a few others like that too. They really just didn't want to see us. So that was unfortunate. But it was great to see the cages, how they made them and with the trees inside. And, and I'm happy that they're saved. And I, I think they have the best life they can for their problems. And were you able to go in the mouse house, Gaia, or is that closed? Well, we decided against it. <laughs> it's too close to lunch. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, they have a, a particular a house on there. And I'm gonna, they would have let you in the mouse house, though, if you had wanted to go with I it. I think That's so, amazing. yes. But apparently the smell is rather obnoxious. Yeah, and this is I where they kind of process all the all the life that are fed to the owls. Well, I think that's about it. Unless anybody else has something to say, we can uh, we can say good night to everybody. Good night. Thank good you. Night. Thank you very much. Don't go away yet. Can I speak? Yes. Uh, Sue and I happen to have tickets for an Owl Foundation tour on September 25th. We're not going to use them. So if anybody wants them, get in touch with Ken and he'll let us know and we'll get the tickets to you somehow. They're, they're doing tours on two weekends this year, are they? Evidently. Yeah. Maybe just to spread people out a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I think they've done, I think they've had multi, uh, multiple tours in the past. Well, I thought it was usually just over um, over one weekend, though, but uh, in the past, but, you know. Well, if, yeah. if we're wrong, blame Sue, she looks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're probably right. And I imagine it might have been something they did so that they had smaller tour groups yeah. um, during COVID. But seriously, it'd be, I, I, we, we'd really like to see the tickets get used if somebody is interested or knows somebody who is. I'm going to stop the recording. Like, if people want to stop and chat. Um, stay in chat, that's fine.